So last time we covered all the different first order circuits. Well, not all as in an exhaustive list of every possible circuit topology with all possible uh, locations and values of resistors, but you know, the basic ones. So series and parallel RC circuits, series and parallel RL circuits. As a sort of refresher, let's go over the parallel RL circuit. So this one we used a step uh, exponential decay as the uh, forcing function, and it was a parallel RL circuit. After using Ohm's law, you know, IR is equal to one over R times, you know, VL in this case, and VL of T is equal to L times DIL of T DT. We were able to get our uh, trans or ODE IN of T is equal to L over R times DIL of T DT uh, plus IL of T. And then we get a characteristic equation solution of lambda is equal to negative R over L. Another way of saying this is, you know, our time constant tau is equal to L over R. So we got a homogeneous solution, and then we put a, uh, a form of our particular solution that matches the exponential forcing function. Uh, we have this condition that says that we don't need any T multipliers. Uh, we do a bit of algebra after putting our, our particular solution into our ODE, and we get that coefficient b is equal to i1 over 1 plus l over r times b. Or notice all of our units work out very nicely for this coefficient. If you're meticulous about your units, you can usually get a uh, sensible answer every step of the way when you're using ODE methods. And then you write your complete solution, solve for a, start with the circuit starting at rest. So il at time 0 is equal to 0. And you get a is equal to negative the co same coefficient as b. So we get our I L of T and then one more step. We were asked for V L of T, not I L of T. So we use the constitutive equation to say V L of T is equal to L times the derivative of I L of T. Where, you know, we should be very comfortable taking derivatives like this by now. So we did an example of numbers and we plot out uh, things, you know, you know, if you're ever asked to plot things on homework, you know, please feel free to use you know, MATLAB or Excel or what have you to do your plots, you know, please don't feel like you have to hand draw uh, plots on homework unless it says like sketch by hand or something like that. Usually when we ask for plots on homework, we mean computer generated ones. So uh, then we started the series LC circuit, which is also known as a tank circuit. So when we get our nice characteristic equation up top, we get V N of T is equal to LC times the second derivative with respect to time of V C of T plus, you know, V C of T itself. So when we write our characteristic equation using our nice little shortcut, we get lambda is equal to plus or minus J times square root of one over LC. And we got our homogeneous solution, uh, A1 E to the plus J one over square root LCT and then plus a2 e to the minus, should be a minus sign, j times one over square root lc times t. And then we can rewrite this using Euler's identity. Uh, there should be a j out front of this term right here. And we can just say that the, you know, using real valued functions, you know, uh, homogeneous solution of the capacitor voltage is b1 cosine of t over square root lc plus b2 sine of t over square root lc. And this is basically where we stopped. Do we have any questions up to this point? Hearing none. We go forward. Uh, we define the natural frequency to be one over square root of LC. It's associated with, you know, these, you know, sinusoidal functions. It's the radial frequency there. And, you know, it plays a very similar role to the time constants in our first order circuits. You know, we see, you know, omega not squared is one over LC a lot of times. So it's going to show up again and again and again, uh, especially later on in this course when we talk about, uh, you know, you know, bandpass responses as well as filters shows up a lot. So now, uh, you know, let's deal with, uh, 
you know, finding a complete solution to this series LC circuit. So for this case, we're going to start at step seven with a transient input. So assume we have V N of T is equal to V I or V one times E to the B T times U of T. So our particular solution is just going to be, you know, some constant A times E to the B T U of T, you know, where A is some unknown coefficient. We got to solve for that by plugging our particular solution into our ODE. We get V1 E to the V T U of T is equal to, well, here is just, you know, V C of T. And then here is its second derivative times LC. So A comes out front. We'll get LC times the second derivative, which is just B squared, and then E to the B T U of T. You know, multiply through by E to the minus B T, you know, uh, evaluate for time greater than zero, and you'll get V1 equals ALC B squared plus A, where you factor in A out of both sides, and you get A is equal to V1 over one plus LC B squared. So now we can write the complete solution. VC of T is, you know, this constant A times E to the VT U of T plus B1 cosine of omega naught T plus B2 sine of omega naught T. So we solve for B1 and B2, knowing the circuit is at rest at time equals zero minus. So the capacitor voltage is zero. So that's going to be equal to plug in zero here. Remember, E to the zero is one. And then, you know, we're evaluating uh, at time equals zero plus. So this is one. And then we'll have a uh, cosine of zero. Remember, cosine of zero is also one. So we'll get a B out front plus B2 times sine of zero, where sine of zero is zero. So uh, with this, we can solve right away for B1. You know, it's not a linear combination of B1 and B2. You can just write it right away. We'll get B1 is negative V1 over 1 plus LCB squared. Now we need our other initial condition, which is that the capacitor started at rest. So we get that the current through the capacitor, same as the current through the inductor. Uh, is equal to zero, which is C times uh, the derivative of the capacitor voltage at time zero. Or, you know, we'll get zero is equal to C times derivative of this term. So we'll get a B come out front and then replicate the coefficient E to the B evaluated at time zero. So we'll take the derivative here. So we'll get B one times omega naught times the C from out front times uh, cosine uh, or times negative sine of omega naught T. And then we plug in T equals zero. And then we take the derivative of the last term. So we'll get a C out front, B2, and then we'll get a omega naught brought out front by the chain rule. And then we'll have cosine of omega naught T, derivative of the sine of omega naught T. Uh, and then we plug in T equals zero. And then remember cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero. You get B2 is equal to uh, negative V1B over omega naught times one plus LCB squared, where these Cs out front are common of every term, so they're negligible. So we'll rewrite the complete solution to the capacitor voltage. And we'll notice something too. So if we look back at our A naught expression, we notice that uh, LC is the same as one over omega naught squared. So we'll have, you know, V1 over one plus B squared over omega naught squared. We can multiply top and bottom by omega naught squared. And we get this coefficient, which looks just a little bit nicer uh, because it uses uh, omega naught rather than relying on the circuit components. Either way, as long as you write out that you define omega naught as one over squared LC, both answers are correct. We'll get V1 omega naught squared over omega naught squared plus B squared times from our complete solution E to the BT. And then we'll have a minus cosine omega naught T. And then B2 is just the same thing as B1 multiplied by B over omega naught. So we'll get a minus B over omega naught times sine over omega naught T 
and then close brackets u of t. So this is the complete response to a transient input in the series LC circuit. Notice we do get a transient component, but we also get continuous oscillation in the form of you know, you know, these two sinusoidal components. So even though you apply an input that you know uh, goes away, all the energy from that initial input gets translated into electric field energy and the capacitor magnetic field energy of the inductor, and it just sloshes back and forth continuously. So your your exponential term goes away, but all that energy just becomes a continuous oscillation between the inductor and capacitor. So this sort of makes sense with our intuition. Any questions? Hearing no questions, I'll move on. So let's, you know, basically, you know, keep our symbolic analysis for the homogeneous solution. And then we will look at a sinusoidal input instead. So assume the particular solution has a forcing function, uh, Vn of t is equal to V sub a times sine of omega one t times u of t, where we'll say omega one is not equal to omega naught. so that we can avoid having to deal with any sort of T multipliers. We'll get V sub C P of T, the particular solution to capacitor voltage is equal to D1 cosine of omega one T U of T plus D2 sine of omega one T U of T. Remember, apply a sinusoid, you must include both the cosine and sine components, uh, you know, with the respective coefficients, or you have to, uh, you know, say it's, you know, sine, but with a phase offset uh, unknown defined as well. So you solve the ODE with substitution of the particular solution and you match equivalent terms. So here we get from our ODE, EN of T uh, is equal to VA sine of omega one T U of T. At the very end, we get our particular solution which is, you know, in brackets, D1 cosine omega 1t plus D2 sine of omega 1t times U of t. And then we need the second derivative of this term. Uh, so the second derivative, well, we'll get, uh, first of all, we'll get D1 minus sine of omega 1t with an omega 1 out front. Derivative again, we'll get D1 times omega 1 squared times negative cosine of omega 1t. You know, you take the second derivative of a trigonometric function, you get, you know, negative uh, its radial frequency squared times the function itself. Same thing goes for the, the sinusoid component as well. So we get negative LC times an omega one squared times the exact same function U of T. So we match terms on the left and right side. So there's no cosine term on the left-hand side, and that must be equal to, you know, D1 combination, D1 uh, cosine of omega 1t. So that means D1 must equal zero because there's no cosine term on the left-hand side. Matching equivalent terms, D1 must equal zero. Now we'll match the sinusoidal terms. So we'll get VA is equal to negative LC omega 1 squared D2 plus D2, you know. So when we do that, we get, you know, a sort of one minus LC omega one squared. And then we divide that, that's the, the divisor of VA. So that's how you get this expression for D2. Now, what we can do is say, okay, remember LC is equal to one over omega naught squared. So we can rewrite it as VC of T is equal to VA over 
one minus quantity omega one over omega naught quantity squared times sine of omega one t u of t and then plus b1 cosine of omega dot t plus b2 sine of omega naught t. Now we can solve for b1 and b2 knowing the circuit is at rest. So again, vc at time zero is zero. So we'll get, you know, sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one times its coefficient, and then b2 times zero is zero. So b1 is equal to zero. Okay. And we'll get IL at time equals zero is equal to C times the derivative of our complete solution. And then evaluate it at time equals zero. Uh, I should have plugged in a zero here. So that should say uh, cosine of omega one times zero. I forgot to evaluate. So the derivative of this term, well, sine becomes a cosine and then with an omega one out front. And then we'll get B one omega naught times negative sine of omega naught T evaluate at T equals zero. Then we'll get B two times cosine of omega naught T with an omega naught out front evaluated at T equals zero. You work this out, you get that, you know, B2 is equal to uh, negative our D2 expression times omega one over omega naught. So we will rewrite the complete solution to the capacitor voltage as VC of T is equal to VA over one minus omega one over omega naught quantity squared times quantity sine of omega one T minus omega one over omega naught times sine of omega naught T all times U of T. So remarks, the circuit lacked resistance. The cosine term in the particular solution ended up not being needed. Don't get in the habit of saying, well, I know it's going to be zero, so I can just ignore this in my particular solution. Um, don't, don't do that. Uh, and then the circuit was at rest, so I could ignore the cosine term in the homogeneous solution. Uh, again, don't get in the habit of dropping that out. That would be even worse uh, to modify your homogeneous solution based off what you think might happen. Uh, write out, you know, the complete forms of your homogeneous and particular solutions and let the math do the rest for you. And if you ever suspect an answer like this is erroneous, consider checking with SPICE and the plotting tool. So, yeah, we, we have circuit simulators out there and, you know, it's perfectly fine to use them to sort of check your answers. As a note, notice what happens when omega one is close to omega dot. So when we say, you know, omega one close to omega naught, that's gonna cause this denominator to get really, really large because we'll get something that's you know really close to one and one minus something close to one is gonna be a uh, really uh, big value when it's in the denominator or uh, big value when it's in the denominator. So we'll get a very, very large excitation whenever omega one is close to omega naught. This is, you know, called the resonance phenomena. Surely someone has a question by now. I'll, I'll move on to the uh, numerical example and you can think of a question. So we'll say that the input is sinusoidal six volts times sine of 120 radians per second, you know, units of omega one times T, U of T. We'll have an inductor of five millihenry and a capacitor of 200 microfarads. When we solve, we'll get, you know, omega naught is one over the square root of L times C. Well, L times C is just uh, uh, one E six, yeah or I guess one E minus six. And then when you take this 
reciprocate it and take the square root, you get omega naught is equal to 1,000 radians per second. So you get a ho homogeneous solution of B1 cosine of 1,000 radians per second times T plus B2 side of 1,000 radians per second times T. You get that the ratio of omega 1 to omega naught is equal to 0 0.12. And D1 is zero, D2 is equal to 6.08766 volts using this equation for D2, or you know this overall expression right there. And the complete solution VC of T is equal to you know 6.08766 volts times sine of 120 radians per second T minus 0.12 1,000 radians per second times T times U of T. So notice you know we apply a sinusoid of six volts, and we got uh, something at the same frequency, but its uh, magnitude was even larger. So that's okay in this type of circuit. That's okay. Because we're, we're subtracting out this component too, which I'm missing a sign right there. It should say 0. 0.12 times sine. of 1,000 radians per second too. Again, I swear I check my work, but not to really enough. Why does D1 go to zero again? So according to the remark, we said that the particular solution didn't have a cosine term because the circuit lacked resistance. So if we go back to uh, D1, when we substituted in, there was no cosine term on the left, but there was cosine terms on the right. So that means D1 had to go to zero. Now, if we had some sort of resistance term, what we would end up with is an ODE that includes the first derivative as well as the second derivative in the function itself, as we'll see later today. And when that happens, um, we'll end up with, you know, uh, a D1 times sine term, which would have matched to uh, something on the left-hand side. And we'd have a system of linear equations to solve. So yeah, because there's no term that depend, depended on the first derivative, there was no you know, D1 times a sinusoid term that would match with something on the left-hand side. Does that answer your question, Brandon? Yep, yep, okay. Would the, the signal on slide 38 even look like a normal sine wave? I don't know. I mean, it would look like the sum of two sine waves. So if you will bear with me for a little bit, I haven't used Grapher in a long time. See if I can get the Mac OS Grapher utility to work well. So 6.08766 times sine of 120 times, uh, we'll use X in this case because you know it prefers that, times zero minus 0 0.12 times sine of 1,000 times X times uh, X greater than equal to zero. Oh, it doesn't like that. We'll, we'll leave out the step function. Okay, and then we'll zoom out. Oh, come on. Doesn't like how much stuff is on the screen. So we'll say frame limits. Uh, we'll say x equals zero to x is equal to um, it oscillates pretty fast. So I don't know, uh, 0 0.06 seconds. And then we'll say, yeah, we'll go from negative seven to seven. We get something that looks like this. So I guess for the sake of the audience and to answer Aubrey's question, you know, we get something, you know, it looks like, you know, a, a very slow sine wave, which is our, you know, sine of 120 times T. And then 
minus a, a faster sine wave, which is oscillating on top of it and is a little is smaller. So you know by superposition, you know, you know we get a overall sine wave, uh, kind of you know uh, mean value, and then we get this sinusoid on top of it. So you know you might think you're getting the wrong answer, but you know this is why we use you know spice or a plotting tool. Okay. Any more questions? So we talked about the series LC circuit. Let's talk about the parallel LC circuit. So this is the dual of the series LC circuit. Makes sense. So here, if we have, you know, a transient input, we'll get a very, very similar uh, differential equation. In fact, it's the exact same form, except, you know, Vn became In and Vc of t became Il of t. But by duality, everything else, the Lc out front stays, also stays as Lc. So, you know, we can basically reuse the result from slide 35 and get that, you know, Il of t is equal to I1 omega naught squared over omega naught squared plus B squared quantity e to the bt minus cosine omega naught t minus b over omega naught times sine of omega naught t all times u of t. So yeah, if you know how the series LC circuit works, the parallel LC circuit is, you know, a rather straightforward change of variables. And that's going to come in handy later on in the course as well when we're like, wait a minute, you know, we have the same omega naught, uh, yeah, involved. We still define omega naught is you know one over square root LC. So that brings us to the parallel RLC circuit. So now we're in chapter eleven. So ODEs for the RLC circuits. So now we're going to add a resistance uh, to the inductor and capacitor circuit. So if they're all in parallel, we'll get, you know, some I N of T feeds into an R, an L, and a C, where we have each of their currents, you know, summing to I N. So that's the KCL equation right there. And we're going to find that the roots of this characteristic equation, you know, can possibly have real and imaginary components. So all our constitutive equations, so we have Ohm's law that says I R is equal to 1 over R V R of T. I C of T is equal to C D V C D T and V L of T is equal to L D I L D T. You know, all three constitutive equations living together in happiness. So we have K V L and substitution. So all of the voltages are the same. So we get that I N of T is I C of T, I R of T, and I L of T all added together. So I L of T gets to stick around by itself. For the resistance, we have IR times, you know, L. I, did I, I meant uh, IR of T is equal to 1 over R times L times DIL of T DT. And then IC of T is equal to C times DBC DT. So it's C times L times the second derivative of IL with respect to time. So as you can see, this looks exactly like the ODE we had for the parallel RL or parallel LC circuit, except now we have a middle term that depends on the first derivative instead of uh, only on the second and function itself. So this was kind of what uh, we were getting at with uh, Brandon's question earlier. Sorry. So we can write the characteristic equation as zero is equal to LC times lambda squared plus L over R times lambda plus one. Or, uh, you know, if we don't want to have a leading term in front of our lambda, we, you know, factor LC out of everything. And then we say zero is equal to lambda squared over, or lambda squared plus one over RC times lambda plus one over LC. And 
we were like, okay, this is all added together. Quadratic equation, we must use the quadratic formula. So we'll get lambda one and two, you know, two different options is equal to one over two RC plus or minus the square root of quantity one over two RC quantity squared minus one over LC. So that's what you get after you massage things around in the quadratic equation. or the quadratic formula. So we can write the ho homogeneous solution as I sub L homogeneous is equal to I or A1 E to the lambda 1 T plus A2 E to the lambda 2 T. But right now, you know, we don't have any values. So we don't know whether we have, you know, you know, two real solutions, uh, just one root repeated for lambda 1 and 2, or if we could possibly even have, you know, complex roots, because what's under the square root here could be negative. So there are three cases based on the discriminants of the characteristic equation, and you don't know exactly what they are without having some idea of the component values. So unlike before, we can't just write a generic form for our homogeneous solution in terms of the functions involved. I mean, we wrote it like this, but you know, we we could you know, need a T here if we have the repeated root case. So, you know, this is just, you know, our, our sort of best guess until we know which case. So we're going to define three different quantities. So we will say, uh, we'll start with the middle one which we have uh, the natural frequency omega naught is equal to one over square root LC. That stays the same from the series and parallel LC circuit cases. We're gonna define an attenuation called sigma P, sigma sub P, and that's equal to one over two times R times C. Uh, and we'll have omega D, the damped resonance frequency, is equal to the square root of omega naught squared minus sigma p squared. So let's look at each of the three cases. Oh, wait. Yeah. Thank you for the explanation, Roman. Uh, that should answer uh, Tanyan's question. So of the three cases, let's look at the possibility when there are two distinct real roots. So we will say, okay, under the square root, we have square root of omega p squared minus omega naught squared. So whenever the first term is greater than the second term, we'll have you know a positive number under the square root, discriminant is positive. So omega p squared, squared is greater than omega naught squared, two distinct real roots to our characteristic equation. So the natural solution has two exponentially decaying terms. I sub L homogeneous is equal to A1 E to the lambda 1 T plus A2 E to the lambda 2 T, where lambda 1 and 2 follow this, you just take the plus and the minus sign. But you know, you're left with real numbers for each. And you know, you can go on to find a complete solution if you're given an input, you know, like this one where we have a transient input. Uh, it's going to be very similar to the parallel LC circuit case. Uh, you know, you know uh, we're not going to work through the complete solution uh, this time because it just adds a lot of steps and we're just trying to deal with a survey of things. So you're on your own for that part. you know how particular solutions work. So hopefully you are able to figure out how to do it with the second order circuit like this. So the second of the three cases is called the critically damped case. So it's when omega p squared or sigma p squared is equal to omega naught squared. That means there's a, a you know, discriminant is zero. That means we get a, a single real root of multiplicity tool at omega one is equal to omega, or lambda one is equal to lambda two equals negative sigma p is just negative one over two RC. So 
in that case, you know, it's just, it's, you know, the equality case is, you know, something that's really hard to achieve in practice. You won't get it by picking random values of resistance, uh, inductance, and capacitance. However, you know, if you design your circuit as such, you can get the critically damped uh, case to happen. So you can uh, equate these equations for omega p and omega naught when they're squared, and you can figure out the condition that gets you the critically damped case. So the homogeneous solution requires a term of a T multiplier because we have repeated roots. So by the special cases on our uh, slide 11, I think, we can get the homogeneous solution is A1 e to the negative sigma PT plus A2 times T times e to the negative sigma PT. And then finding the complete solution is slightly harder than the parallel LC circuit case because there's a T involved when you end up, you know, uh, guessing a form for a particular solution, you have to take a derivative using the product rule right here. So that's going to cause a little bit of issue when you do that. But, you know, you should get that, you know, none of your coefficients are functions of time. Remember, these are constant coefficient differential equations. So uh, it should all work out if you do your math carefully. And then lastly, uh, the third case is the called the underdamped uh, parallel RLC circuit. So it happens when omega p squared is less than omega naught squared. So that means the discriminant is negative. That means there are two complex conjugate roots, you know, complex meaning they have both real and imaginary parts to this uh, equation. So the roots may be written as uh, should be a minus sign, should be negative one over two RC plus or minus. And then, you know, if this is a negative term, we can switch the order of subtraction and then we'll put a, you know, uh, factor a negative one out front. And then we'll have square root of negative one is J. So we'll have a plus or minus J square root of the flipped one over LC minus, again, uh, I corrected this somewhere. So the, the parentheses shouldn't be around the one over LC. It should only be around the one over two RC. So move this left parenthesis uh, right in front of negative one over two RC. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> That makes a big difference. So again, note the order under the radical or sigma or lambda one comma two is equal to negative sigma P plus or minus J times omega D. Or again, omega D was omega not square root of omega not squared minus sigma P squared, which is what you get when you correct that. That equation is correct, so. The homogeneous solution simplifies with exponent properties. So you get I L H of T is equal to A one E to the negative Sigma P plus J Omega DT plus A two E to the negative Sigma P E plus minus J Omega D times D or by exponent properties, you know, uh, addition in the exponent is the same thing as multiplication of powers. And then you can factor out the e to the negative sigma pt that they have in common, or il h of t is equal to e to the negative sigma pt quantity a1 plus complex exponential plus a2 times the negative complex exponential. Use Euler's identity again. We should be used to dealing with this from the, the LC tank circuit. So we can turn this into homogeneous solution of e to the negative sigma pt quantity b1 plus times cosine omega dt plus b2 sine of omega dt, where we have the relationship between b1 and b2. And finding the complete solution in this case requires some effort. So, you know, you will, you will deal with something similar on homework. Look forward to homework, I guess. But, you know, in terms of, you know, the, uh, conceptual part, you know, this is what we need to cover. Finding the particular solution is 
how well do you remember algebra and arithmetic and calculus? What questions do we have? I'm going to cover uh, the series RLC circuit, the counterpart to the parallel RLC circuit uh, right now because it's uh, uh, you know something worth doing here. It has a good summary of slides. So here we can see RLC in series now with a voltage source. So we can write VC of T uh, as an ODE with a forcing function of V in of T, where now we have you know LC D squared, uh, VC of T DT squared, plus RC times DVC DT, plus VC of T. Note that you can get a very general second order differential equation, uh, or characteristic polynomial rather. Uh, your characteristic polynomial will be of the form zero is equal to lambda squared plus two times sigma P lambda plus omega naught squared. So we'll get, you know, sigma P in this case is defined as R over two times L. Omega naught is still defined as one over square root of LC. And if you write it like this, omega D is still the square root of omega naught squared minus sigma P squared. Here you get that lambda one two is equal to, that should be negative R over two L. So there's a negative sign missing there plus or minus square root of R over two L's quantity squared minus one over LC. And then we have this little table with three cases, over damped, critically damped and under damped based off of the inequality involved between sigma P squared and omega naught squared. And then remember over damped has real and distinct roots, uh, critically damped has real and repeated roots and then under damped has complex conjugates roots. So, this slide number 45 is a really good summary of what we did uh, at a high level for both the parallel and series RLC circuits. Surely someone has a question like, you know, this is definitely a little bit more intense because we're dealing with, you know, uh, complex numbers instead of, you know, just real numbers or just imaginary numbers. Omega naught squared in the characteristic equation. Okay. So for this one, uh, what you will do is I'll, I'll, I'll do it for the parallel case and I'll say the similar thing applies to the parallel case or to the series case. So we'll take everything here and divide by LC. So zero divided by LC is still zero. LC lambda squared divided by LC is just lambda squared. L over R lambda divided by LC cancels out the L on top and puts a C in the denominator to get one over RC times lambda. And then one divided by LC is just one over LC. So we notice that this is just omega naught squared. And then that one over RC is just twice sigma P. Also, this is missing the negative side. I screwed up in both places. You would think I would know the quadratic equation at my age. Oh yeah. So something very similar happens, you know, you'll replace all these VC with, you know, the appropriate powers to Lambda. You'll divide through by LC, you'll get zero is equal to Lambda squared. Uh, RC divided by LC is just R over L. And then we'll get one over LC for this last term. Good. If there are no more questions, I'm gonna move on. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of caution here about more complicated circuits that you're going to see on homework and exams. Uh, I'm obviously not gonna work through, I think there are eight different various configurations of RLC circuits because you can mix and match parallel and series. 
So we did it strictly in series and strictly in parallel combinations of R, L, and C. Even the first order circuits can get tricky if there are extra resistors placed in the circuit. So say, for example, you have uh, some voltage source feeding a resistor in series. Uh, and then after that, there is a parallel R and L. So having multiple resistors can make our ODEs more complicated. There's other possible arrangements of the RLC circuits. So again, you can do series in parallel or parallel series uh, sorts of circuits where you're moving things around. And it's gonna produce you know, different ODEs from the ones presented here. So furthermore, there are RC, RC, and RL, RL circuit order circuits among the many possible options. So if you have, you know, a uh, non-trivially connected pair of capacitors or non-trivially connected pair of inductors, by non-trivial, I mean that, you know, they aren't just inductors in series or inductor or capacitors in parallel or things like that. You know, obviously if two capacitors in parallel are going to act like a single capacitor. But if you have, you know, uh, some you know weird combination of resistors and capacitors, you know you can get you know second order circuits. So I will say that the sort of summary is the order of a circuit depends on the number of non-trivial reactive elements. So again, you know you can't just have two inductors in parallel and say, oh, you know that that counts as a second order circuit. No, you get a first order circuit. But if you have like you know resistor in series and then a parallel RL. They'll have a first order circuit because there's just one reactive element, one inductor. If you have, you know, RC, RR, LR, you would have a second order circuit because there's one capacitor and one inductor. You can always add more resistors to a covered topology to increase the complexity of the ODE while still relying on the methods we covered here. So the method is fine, you know, get comfortable with the method. You can always, you know, make a more complicated for, circuit for yourself and try to solve it and see what you get. And that's, you know, one way to study. How about uh, RLR? RLR is basically this first order circuit I described up here. So, you know, yeah, ours, the resistor after the inductor, will it make a difference? it would still be a first order circuit because there's only one inductive element, one energy storage device, the inductor. And then we, it, uh, you, it'll combine? get a, huh? No, you won't be able to combine them. Okay. Yeah, you won't be able to find a single equivalent resistance there. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Hearing no more questions, we will move on to the last topic for this lecture set, which is uh, switch circuits. So we're going to define how you do a switch circuit, and we are not going to be able to uh, finish the example, so we'll get partway through. So here's the analysis procedure. So one, figure out the state of the circuit before the first temporal boundary, where temporal boundary we're going to denote is happening at time t sub k. That's any sort of sudden action. So that's like a step function or a switch opens or closes, something like that. So we'll use state values as initial conditions and figure out the uh, immediately after the temporary boundary. So say, for example, you have an inductor and you say, okay, it starts at three amps at time T equals zero minus. We know that the inductor current is gonna stay at three amps at time uh, T equals zero plus. So we'll generate the ODE for the circuit topology after the temporal boundary, T sub K. We'll find the complete solution. So we'll go through all those like, you know, 10 steps we've been going through for our previous examples. Then we'll solve the state values immediately prior to the next temporal boundary. So we got to figure out what our new initial condition is. So we'll got to figure out what the inductor current has changed to. It started at three amps, but it's going to change to some value before the next temporal boundary, T sub K plus one, where, you know, say for example, a switch closes. 
And then we'll repeat analysis from the beginning using variable transformation. T prime is equal to T minus T sub K plus one. And if there are, you know, additional temporal boundaries, you know, say we're at T sub K plus two, we'll define T double prime as, you know, you know, T prime minus, you know, T sub K plus two. So prime. So you can just keep chaining together all of these uh, variable transformations in order to make sure that, you know, we're solving for the circuit at T equals zero. So I, I, I state to you that this allows us to basically say we can solve any circuit, assuming it started at uh, time T equals zero by using this transformation. So that allows us to be uh, convenient. So here is the circuit we're going to be solving for our switched circuit example. So find V sub C of T or such that the switch S1 has been down for a long time before switching up at T is equal to T naught is equal to zero. And then it switches back down at time T1, staying there for the remainder of time. Furthermore, we know that four times this inductance is equal to the capacitance times the resistance squared. Oh, interesting fact. So we have this, you know, single pole dual throw switch where it's, you know, one single switching bar that goes between two different states that, you know, connect up to the circuit. So we got to figure out, okay, what's happening here? T prime does not represent a derivative. It just represents a change in uh, variables. So it's just a variable transformation. Uh, yes, because we say the switch has been down for a long time, we would assume that any energy in this RLC loop would have uh, been dissipated through the resistance. So, you know, we can assume no inductor current and no capacitor voltage. So the circuit is at rest, Luke. Any more questions? Any questions about the homework? You should now be able to complete all of homework too. Nope. Hearing no questions, we'll go ahead and call class just a little bit early today. Um, you know, again, work on your homework. I'll try to work on grading. That hasn't been going that well. Uh, and I will release lecture set three a little early so that we can all uh, look at it tomorrow. Energy can oscillate infinitely. Uh, I mean, technically it does oscillate forever. However, it will decay exponentially asymptotically approaching zero because you know we have a resistance in these types of circuits. What would happen if there was no resistance? Then it becomes like the LC tank circuit that we discussed up here, where we said that, oh yeah, there is this continuous oscillation that goes on forever. That's called undamped response. There's no resistance, undamped. Are we going to get the solution to homework one so we can study it for the exam? Uh, I mean, I guess if you're asking for it, why not? The exam will be next Friday, right? Yes. It'll open at Friday at noon and close at Saturday, 11.59 p.m.
All right, you're welcome, everyone. See you at office hours if you're going. Goodbye. You're welcome, everyone. <laughs>